Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Libraries Transform webinar presented by ALA and Libraries Transform. Today's webinar, Community Reading Platforms, Transforming Libraries, Impacting the Classroom, is brought to us in, with Biblio Board's generous support. We all know that technology continues to transform and reinvent what we do in today's library. Collaborations focus on, any, there are a number of collaborations that focus on new licensing models for eBooks, combine that with geolocation technology that allows for greater access, and software platforms providing readers with a consumer-grade experience, and libraries have never been in a better position to reach and engage our communities. Today, we're going to take a look at eBooks Minnesota, a project pioneered by Minitex and the Minnesota Department of Education, which has taken advantage of these technological advances and found a niche serving classrooms throughout the state of Minnesota with DRM-free eBooks from top K-12 publishers. We're going to talk about how this project came about, how it's affecting classrooms and libraries, and how and why publishers are willing to participate what stories, usage data can tell us, and how this collaboration can work in other states with the right team and technology. I'm your moderator, Stephen Yates, and I currently serve as the president of the American Association of School Librarians. I also uh, am a former uh, public and school librarian myself, and I currently serve as the School Library and Media Program Coordinator at the University of Alabama School of Library and Information Studies. Oh, there I am. And you see our other panelists, and I want to take a moment to introduce them quickly. First, we have Jennifer Verbrugge, who is the Library Program and Partnership Coordinator for State Library Services at the Minnesota Department of Education. She oversees various grant programs and statewide initiatives for youth. Next, we'll hear from Valerie Horton, who is the Director of Minitex, a network of academic, public, state, and special libraries working together to improve library services for their users in Minnesota as well as North and South Dakota. Valerie has served as the director since 2012. Joe Riley is from North Star Editions, one of the publishers featured in the eBooks Minnesota project. Joe has been in the publishing industry for over 20 years and now leads the sales team for all North Star Edition imprints, including Flux. Karen Quayley is a former school librarian and now works as a digital learning coordinator for the Bloomington Public Schools. She develops programs to support teachers as they implement student-centered approaches to personalized learning. She is also past co-president of the Information and Technology Educators of Minnesota, ITEM, and a Google for Education certified trainer. Lisa Gearman is the Information Innovative Learning Specialist for Chaska High School and Eastern Carver County Schools in Minnesota. Lisa has worked in Minnesota schools for over 20 years and was named the ITEM Media Specialist of the Year in 2015. And finally, Jessica Duggan is the Chief Operating Officer at BiblioLab, the makers of BiblioBoard, and the that's the technology behind eBooks Minnesota. So let's start from the beginning. How did the eBooks Minnesota project come to be? Thank you, Stephen, and hello, everyone. I am Jennifer Verbrugge, and I work on library programs and partnerships for State Library Services. The State Library Agency of Minnesota, which is housed in the Minnesota Department of Education. I'll share some background information and history of our project, just to give you some context before we dive into the product more deeply. In the early 2010s, there was a bit of a national fever over what libraries should do about, with, and to ebooks. We here in Minnesota were no exception. Across all types of libraries, the bottom line question was, how can we make more ebooks available to our users for less money and with fewer restrictions? With that question in mind, a group of library leaders gathered together to discuss the future of ebooks in Minnesota. Just a little background, uh, Minnesota has 12 regional public library systems that serve as either administrative entities or cooperatives. Minnesota also has seven multi-county, multi-type library systems, which provide continuing education and encourage increased collaboration among all library types. 
The leadership team that met to discuss the future of eBooks across the state included representatives of the regional public library systems, the multi-county multi-types, school library media centers, academic libraries, Minnesota's library network, which is Minitex, and our state library agency. I was the state library support staff there on the list, and both Valerie and Karen, panelists on this webinar, were part of that team. The group met about a dozen times and hatched a plan. The team established four goals for their work. To foster and improve knowledge about eBooks, to engage all types of libraries, to inform local activities, and to identify priorities and next steps for statewide action. With these goals in mind, the team devised a project to both educate librarians and library staff and also to gather feedback from them in order to determine optimal next steps. The team decided on a multi-piece project called Explore eBooks Minnesota, which consisted of webinars and a summit. From April through July 2014, both local and national eBook experts presented informational webinars as part of Explore eBooks Minnesota. National experts included Jamie LaRue, Joe Butler, and Sue Polenka. Topics range from understanding eBook basics to the differences in various business models. With the informational webinars behind them, librarians and library staff were encouraged to take all their eBook knowledge to a central meeting, a summit, in August to discuss eBook issues and solutions with peers. There were keynote presentations that bookended the day, and the bulk of the event consisted of facilitated conversations. The ultimate goal was to answer the question, what actions can we take to enhance user experiences with eBooks in Minnesota? And the answers were meant to inform our next step. Our outputs for the Explore eBooks Minnesota project were pretty strong. Among the five webinars, we saw pre-registration of about 500 people, 370 live attended those webinars, and 276 viewed the archived webinars. And then about 100 librarians showed up in person to St. Catherine University in St. Paul, where we held our summit in August 2014. Attendees represented public, school, academic, government, and special libraries urban, suburban, and rural, so we felt we had a really strong cross-section of libraries represented. Of course, with 100 people participating, there were many recommendations that came out of that summit, and our facilitation partners put together a list of the top 30 for us. I have listed here just six of the recommendations, um, which were come up with a statewide plan, create a statewide ebook collection, build shared content, ensure ease of use and minimize barriers to access, especially for students, to help Minnesotans create their own content and to provide ongoing training and support. Librarians strongly stated that they just wanted to see some sort of action taken, and for leadership, they turned to two organizations with statewide reach, Minitex and State Library Services at the Minnesota Department of Education. So Minitex and State Library Services joined forces to create a collection of eBooks that was free and easy for all Minnesotans to use and highlighted the works of Minnesota's stellar independent publishers. Leveraging our funds and staffing together, we created eBooks Minnesota. And this is just one piece of our statewide eBook strategy and it's the one we'll focus on today. Now I'll turn it over to Valerie Horton, Director of Minitex, and she'll share more details about how it all works. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be able to talk to everybody about um, eBooks Minnesota. Um, when I took this job in uh, 2012, as um, Jen suggested, the number one request from the library community was a, to bring up a statewide ebook collection. And um, we have achieved that with the collection going live on Leap Day 2016. Um, what we have found is that for some of the rural public libraries and for quite a few schools, this ebook collection is their major access point into um, e monographic collections. So, we know that with this collection, we've helped equalize access um, across Minnesota's 
a wide geographical landscape. We have been able to acquire, and we own all these titles, this is not a subscription service, um, 40, over um, 4,100 titles, and that um, this is not a collection that we are buying individual titles. We are buying collections of ti titles from publishers, and I'll talk more about that, and you'll hear more about that from Flux as well. Um, it's been extremely successful. We've had over 120,000 um, ebooks opened. Uh, that averages about 30 circulations per titles. And from what we're hearing from um, a number of uh, other systems, we think that that's a, a pretty strong circulation number. There were a handful of criteria coming out of the summit and the webinars that were absolutely critical to us to make eBooks Minnesota successful. It had to be easy to use. Um, while we have put training material out for people in um, ebooks.mn.org slash about, we have not found very much need for people to use training material. We have videos and some documents, how-to documents. Quite frankly, the, the Biblio board system is so easy to use that that has not been a barrier at all and has been one of the strengths of um, getting our circulation numbers so high. We, from the very beginning, wanted to buy all types of materials for all types of readers. So we have um, a strong K-12 collection, which we're going to talk about mostly today, but we also have scholarly content. We have murder mysteries and romances and wonderful collections of how-to books. Um, you know, one of our more popular books is How to Knit, you know, standard, typical library fare. I think um, one of the other reasons that the system, maybe, maybe the next two bullet points are the two most critical reasons why this system has been so successful, is the geolocation. Um, there are no barriers to gaining access to this system. You do not have to put in a barcode. You do not have to put in a password. You don't have to maintain that. If you go in on um, ebooksmn.org, you are immediately able to access titles with one or two clicks to choose whichever book you wish to, to read. The geolocation feature has worked beautifully. Um, I would say that our uh, problems with the geolocation has been in like the 0.0001% category. Um, I can't imagine ever going back to a system that didn't use geolocation given how popular and successful it has been um, to date. The other uh, two features that I think have really made the system a, a success is the unlimited usage. There's 5.5 million Minnesotans. We could have any given title checked out 5.5 million times. That has really allowed us to do a bunch of creative um, shared title projects, which, we'll talk, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and which um, some of the school librarians will talk about as well. You know, you don't have to worry that the book you want is unavailable. You know, we have a popular restaurant cookbook in this collection, and, and anyone who wants it can get that cookbook and check their recipe at any time that they want. There are no checkup periods. If you check out a title, you can keep it on the system for as long as you wish. So for, for teachers who are preparing coursework or um, librarians who are doing one book, one community reads, the book is there for as long as they need it. They don't have to go back in and renew. We have really, truly, working with Bibliolabs, removed all barriers from use of these titles. And we own these titles. Um, when we buy the titles from Bibliolabs, we get a hard drive that has these titles on it in the unlikely you know, circumstances that our connection with Bibliolab is something happens. We can bring these titles up on another vendor, um, on another system, either open source or another vendor system. So um, that gives us enormous freedom and gives us what we feel as the control that's often lacking um, with some of the other ebook providers. And we have been um, working steadily to integrate the collection into library catalogs. We have you know, API access into Circe Dynex. We're hoping to expand that into other popular um, integrated library systems. 
one of the more popular ways that people can get these titles to their patrons is through an OCLC knowledge base. If you're an OCLC user, you just turn on that knowledge base, and um, every time you update an OCLC, any changes we make to the collection is updated into the library catalogs. For schools and for other organizations, we have the MARC records available so that they can gain access. Plus, of course, we have um, eBooks Minnesota in the Electronic Library of Minnesota. Um, all of the titles have been loaded into our resource sharing system. So if someone is trying to find a title and it's available electronically, we don't have to place an interlibrary loan. It just directs them directly into um, eBooks Minnesota. I think what my own personal favorite part of this collection is, is that we have focused on Minnesota's independent publishers. Um, most state ebook systems, you're buying title by title, which does mean that you get bestsellers like the latest James Patterson or Stephen King, and we, we do not have titles like that in this collection. Um, though we do have some actually popular literary titles. We purchased the entire, either the entire collection. So for instance, we bought every book that Cherry Lake um, and Poison Pen makes available. With other publishers like Lerner, who has a, a gigantic um, uh, collection, we buy a percentage of the title. And, and we've bought, we hope at some point to buy all of the Flux titles, but um, we have about half of them now. Minnesota is really an incredibly lucky state because we have 12 of the top 40 K-12 publishers in the state, which has given us just this incredibly rich content um, to fill within the, the school medium. But we've also paid a lot of attention to Minnesota content. So wherever we can, we have bought books about Minnesota's history or current events. Um, we have also been working to bring in the languages that are unique to Minnesota. So for instance, we're about to load some Ojibwe titles. We have Karen language titles um, published by St. Paul Li uh, Public Library Press. Um, we have uh, Somali titles. And we continue to try to, work, and we're uh, hoping to add more Spanish uh, content than we have. We have also added in a strong collection of public domain. Um, BiblioLab makes that pretty easy to do. So um, while the collection is still small, we think it has enormous potential to grow and get wider and deep and get more depth and breadth. Again, we have a wide variety of titles. Um, the graphic novels have been surprisingly popular. We often hear that that's not true. Um, in public library systems, but in this system for us, they have been hugely used. And um, as I said, we have standard public library fare. We're adding in um, open textbooks and scholarly titles. So it'll be very interesting to track the usage of that compared to the other items in the collection. We have um, a page where librarians, and for that matter, the general public can get information about eBooks Minnesota. It's as you can see in the yellow banner, ebooksmn.org slash about. Um, if any of you are looking to do a statewide system, we have published our collection development policy and our reconsideration policy. Everything we do is out there for everyone to see. Um, that was developed with, um, with members of the community and the state library. Our user guides are out there. Our video is out there. Um, we're trying something that so far we haven't had massive success with, but it's a crowdsourcing. Um, that's that if you buy a book, um, if you read a book, buy a book. Hopefully with a little bit more PR, we might be able to generate more revenue from that. Off that About page, we have produced a lot of PR, including colorful posters. Um, about the books, about eBooks Minnesota, and we've also have a series of bookmarks that people can um, request. And I believe to date that we've given out over 10,000 um, bookmarks. So uh, there's a lot of, because of that unlimited access and um, no circulation periods, 
this collection really lends itself for the one book, one town, one book, one community read. It also loans itself to one book, one class. Um, you know, we'll be looking at statistics and suddenly we'll see a book on arachnids suddenly had 30 circulations in a one week period. And so we're pretty sure that that means that there's a class that has taken up use of um, that title. We haven't launched these yet, but we are right now working on um, book club kits. Uh, so, you know, if anyone could, anyone with um, computer access could now join a book club because it's, it's there for them to use from their library. And maybe these could be used in, con you know, we're hoping that actual physical print book collections in libraries will be connected to our electronic copy and so that we can get that real bang from the buck. Um, we also have had communities, um, for instance, this Minnesota Mayhem and one of our more popular titles, Minnesota Madams, um, has, you know, they, they can bring, because we have a strong Minnesota content, people can bring in the author and make the books available through this medium. So overall, my personal opinion is this is one of the more success, successful uh, projects that we've launched. And you're now going to hear more about the details. So I believe that was my last slide. Joanna here from, oops, can everyone hear me? Hi, thanks Valerie. Uh, this is Joe Riley from North Star Editions, and we're one of the publishers that participate in this uh, eBooks Minnesota program. And I'll just kind of tell you about why we got involved in this and what kind of our goals are and how we plan on work with eBooks Minnesota going forward. So who is North Star Editions? We're a publishing company, and you can see a little description of us. We were established in July of 2016. Uh, and we're, uh, we have two imprints and an exclusive distributor of one of and uh, we published the Flux imprint, which is part of the eBooks Minnesota program from Llewellyn Worldwide in July 2016, and that's how we began our publishing program. And then also we acquired the assets of Jollyfish Press, another publishing adult program uh, in middle grade fiction and adult fiction. And um, we also distribute some nonfiction series books that can be used in a classroom or a school library too as well, not unlike some of the content you see from some of the previous publishers listed like Abdo or Learner 2 as well. So the question is, why do we decide to add our book eBooks Minnesota? Uh, we were approached um, by, by Bibliotech through the request from Minitech to join our books. And obviously being a Minnesota publisher is one, though I would say on, on the whole our books, books books don't really reflect anything specific about being a Minnesotan because these books are really young adult fiction that cross genres from fantasy to uh, teen fiction, to uh, teen romance. So none of these ones are particularly set in Minnesota. But what we want to do, as you can see, is we want to increase our exposure of our backlist to eBooks and make those books available to a wide amount of readers. Uh, we want to drive awareness of North Star Edition and our recent acquisition, since we're a new publisher. We'll do this to help get our name out there too as well, not just to uh, the particular readers who don't often know who our publishers are, but at least into the, the library who North Star Editions is. And we want to drive incremental revenue from our backlist titles. So some books that have been out for four or five years, six years, obviously we know some of those particular books um, slowed down in terms of sales for publishers. So this is a way to be able to get our content out in front of a whole new set of readers and who have easy access to that particular book who will become fans of our, those particular books and series that we have. So they may become future readers too as well of our content. And what did we not include? So uh, we did not include some books that were published uh, in the fall of 2015 or spring of 16. Some of those newer books we'd like to sort of hold back in terms of to maximize the revenue we can on the individual basement into the trade markets. Um, and if you're looking for a reason to encourage uh, publishers to join this program when you're out, if you're out talking to publishers in your own states, um, this, this could cut across trade publishers, but also textbook publishers that you can um, there's certain backlist books that, as I mentioned earlier, can be around for quite a while that people can go and uh, pick up um, and um, get through this particular program, eBooks in Minnesota, become fans of that particular author, and sort of create future readers, as I said, of this, these particular books. 
and then not sort of sacrifice some of these particular pieces you have for some of the new books that publishers need to do to help drive and make their bottom line too as well. But it's a way to able to, as I said, drive that incremental revenue and also bring in fans for your books. And so that's what we do not include for those particular books. And then other publishers, like you're dealing with academic publishers, they may say they want to um, embargo, in a sense, their textbooks or something that gets used on an often basis that they don't want available as free. But this is a good way for people to uh, be able to get their, their content in front of a large audience. So what our plans are going forward is we'd like to work with eBooks Minnesota and plan to offer our fall 2015 flex titles. Uh, we have not made any agreement with our Jogger's Press titles that we published or currently publish. And then we also have the imprint that we distribute exclusively called Focus Readers as the aforementioned books that are series nonfiction books we'd like to include in this particular program. And again, to really increase our brand awareness and use out there so that our books become familiar with readers and we feel that this is also a, a mix between incremental revenue and marketing our own content too as well. And I believe that is my last slide. And I will turn this over to Lisa. Thanks, Joe, and keep those flex titles coming from North Star Editions and for our young readers, I really appreciate all those choices. Um, my name is Lisa and I am an Information Innovation Learning Specialist or School Librarian at serving Chaska High School in Chaska, Minnesota, which is a southwest suburb of Minneapolis. And uh, I guess we're an outer ring suburb. We have about 1,500 students at our school this year. We have two high schools in our district, uh, 14 K through 12 schools all together. And we're sitting at about 25% free and reduced lunch students, which is pretty good where in terms of access where students have access to uh, uh, electronics and cell phones and uh, this year, we also will have all of our students at the high school have access to Chromebooks. We did a gradual rollout over the past three years. We started with third, sixth, and ninth grade students, and now we've been in the rollout long enough for all of our students to have a Chromebook. So this is really exciting to be able to offer students uh, equitable access to eBooks. Um, it seems like just not that long ago, Jennifer Nelson, our state librarian, and a group of people had been talking about uh, getting together this collection of statewide ebooks, and we were so excited. And before we knew it, there was this visually appealing presence within Elm, our Electronic Library of Minnesota, um, and we were ready to roll. Um, I was first introduced to eBooks Minnesota and got some professional learning around it uh, by Matt Lee and Beth Stotts from Minitex. And they uh, went around the state and have had a couple Elm Expos where they highlight all sources available to us for free as Minnesota residents, eBooks Minnesota being one of those. And um, I have learned a lot from both of them. And uh, the way that I've taken that back to my school and promoted it with our students at Chaska High School is a, a library orientation road show. So uh, now that we all have Chromebooks, I can go out to the classrooms. I'm not tied so much to having students come into the library for orientation. And I can demonstrate how they can get access to eBooks Minnesota with their Chromebooks and uh, talk to some study skills classes. We have some students, of course, who are in that reluctant reader category, and eBooks Minnesota has a lot of things to offer them, and I'll talk about that um, in one of the next slides here. I've also uh, visited with our uh, ELA teachers, and uh, some of our uh, students don't always get uh, support at home 
to get trips to the library. And so we do a library card drive in the fall, to make sure that everyone has access to that, and knows about library resources, and is able to tap into those. Our um, EL teachers are doing such a great job of reading what young adults read. And so you, uh, eBooks Minnesota provides them an extra layer of support so that they can offer students they can start thinking about not only what do students want to read, but how do they want to read. Is it best for my learning to have a print book, an ebook, an audio book? And eBooks Minnesota gives us that extra layer so students should never have to feel like they don't have anything to read. And it's, it's on demand. They can get it whenever they need it. Um, we've worked with our colleagues, K-12 in, in our Eastern Carver County Schools to tap in to eBooks Minnesota and our fellow colleagues in the Information and Technology Educators of Minnesota, of course, are excited and busy using eBooks Minnesota as well. So in terms of impact with eBooks Minnesota at Chaska High School, um, what I love is that the library is never really closed. Even though we have our uh, physical hours, students can still access ebooks um, whenever they choose. Uh, got that student now who uh, needs their learning to be mobile and on demand, and they can access that with their Chromebooks. And I work with high school students, so of course, they have their cell phones, and, the, and we have to sometimes go where students live. And another feature I really like about eBooks Minnesota is that there's the simultaneous use. That is really fantastic, that a, a classroom teacher could offer uh, a book group to read the same book at the same time. Teachers can uh, put the, um, the book up on a screen in their classroom, all of those things, and that's uh, thankfully something they can do with simultaneous use. And in some of our rural areas in Minnesota, there may not be funds for uh, an ebook platform. So eBooks Minnesota helps create that platform and bolsters any existing ebook platforms. Um, and for high school students, the BiblioBoard app rocks. There is hardly any setup that the students need to do in order to access that, uh, and that's an additional avenue that they have for access. Um, in terms of supporting students, um, if you look at the Future Ready Librarian framework, this enables us as librarians to do some of the, the things, the elements that are involved with personalized learning at the heart of it. And curating, teaching curate students how to curate their own digital resources and tools is so important. In the previous slide, I'll go back to that, you saw the graphic that was, this is, I took a screenshot directly from Biblia Board, and this is a, a curation uh, that they've made for summer reading for teens. So some of the curating that they've already done helps teach students how to do it themselves and helps us as educators offer groups of books for students to recommend. And there is a, I haven't tried this yet, but there is a portion to the Biblia Board uh, part of eBooks Minnesota where you may not know this, but we have a very literate population in Minnesota. We are, Minneapolis was recognized in 2015 by U.S. Today as the most literate city in the U.S. We battle back and forth with Washington, D.C., and we are followed close behind by St. Paul, our sister city. And we have a population of students who are aspiring writers. Uh, we offer, uh, through Metronet and NELSA, uh, teen lit con each year for our high school students where we get national and regional authors to come in and um, spend a day with our students and they have so many questions and ideas about how to publish their work. This year more than ever I had students come to me and say, I created a recipe book, how do I get it published? And those kinds of questions. So there is, as students as creators 
could offer to have their ebooks loaded. There is some criteria that they would need to follow, but the possibility is there. Um, ebooks Minnesota helps us with instructional partnerships. I can work together with teachers. We can uh, take books um, and use uh, text to bookmark and demonstrate different things, how students can annotate. They can make notes in some of the books. Um, being that it's offered free, free through our state library ensures equitable digital access for all of our students. The app is really slick. The presence on the web is beautifully visual so that students can navigate it easily. And it helps us with when budgets are so tight in some of our districts to invest strategically in our digital resources. Um, eBooks Minnesota owns the title. Those are reliable. They're always going to be there for us. And, and whereas sometimes we in the school library sometimes have to purchase access for a certain time period, or eBooks are just for one user at a time. So eBooks Minnesota gives librarians an opportunity to provide that whole extra access. Uh, a whole nother layer of resources. And so I'm so appreciative of this resource and want to take a second to thank Elm and Minitex, our Minnesota publisher that gives us a chance to promote Minnesota publishers and authors. Uh, there is a, I feel like it's customized for us, so there's a lot of Minnesota related content. Not always is it possible with our budgets to have the most updated books on hunting and fishing and snowmobiling and some of the Minnesota um, related content. So I appreciate that as well. There's all the people who have worked so hard to provide funding for those resources. I'm going to turn this over to Karen Quayley. Hey, uh, thank you, Lisa. And Karen, before uh, you get started to give us a district perspective, I do want to remind our participants, if you have any questions or comments, I hope you'll add them in the, on the Q&A pane, uh, and we will get to those after our last presenter. So um, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to uh, go ahead and, um, as you think of them, every, just go ahead and add some questions in there, and we'll get to them here in a moment. All righty, take it away, Karen. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, uh, my name is Karen, and I work as a digital learning coordinator. Um, you will notice that Lisa and I collaborated on our slides, so I'll avoid being redundant in some areas. I am bringing a, a different perspective in that uh, my role is at a, a district level capacity, and so I think Lisa made some really great illustrations of how students are using it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we're connecting with our teachers, our curriculum review cycles, and other uh, large-scale initiatives within our district. Uh, we are pretty serious about taking a focus within our department on how we will personalize learning for our students. Uh, just quickly to give you a snapshot of Bloomington, we're 10,000 students, uh, 15 K-12 schools, and 40% free and reduced lunch. Bloomington, Minnesota is a suburb of the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area. As far as our technology use, in K2, we are using iPads at a one to three ratio, and we are one to one, grades three to 12 with Chromebooks. Um, some of you might be asking yourselves about how our students are able to access Wi-Fi. Uh, a survey of our district through parents, and we do this yearly, finds that we're about three to 4% of our population uh, struggles to find connectivity, and we do provide uh, Wi-Fi service uh, via internet talks that can be sent home to families. From my perspective, uh, my role is to make sure that I'm promoting eBooks Minnesota with our media directors or our school librarians. Uh, they're the same thing, just a little different title. I think that's pretty common these days to see some variation. Our 15 media directors really do work as uh, a digital literacy coach, uh, having focus on citizenship, as well as uh, all things information literacy. And we hope by design then, through this coordination, that they can take these new tools to their buildings and provide that support for teachers and students. Next text, 
Next technology is for learning is our technology program in Bloomington. Uh, I work with a group of tech integrationists and they partner, all of our school librarians partner with the tech integrationists at each site. And so working with this team, it provides an additional avenue for us to make sure we're embedding uh, our digital resources, including eBooks Minnesota. In my role, it is part of my responsibility to connect with that curriculum review process, um, ensuring that as we look at how we either purchase content, create content, or curate our content, that we're aware of those resources that are available to us. And through that process, those curriculum specialists are connecting with our reading teachers, our language arts teachers, and any interventionists. Um, these are some of my areas for improvement or continued focus for this year. Uh, making sure our English language coordinators are aware, um, especially since we do have quite a few dual language offerings within our collection, but again, just making sure that we're providing equitable access. I also intend to coordinate more heavily with our Office of Educational Equity, ensuring uh, that some of our other populations are aware of this product and special services. I think uh, eBooks. Uh, there's, a, there's a great place for ebooks in the services we offer for our students with those needs. Uh, so it is our goal to support personalized learning in, in our project Next Technologies for Learning. We do that through three main elements, digital content, anytime, anywhere learning, and personalized data. And so we do try to make sure that we're enabling our teachers to be able to decide which content they can use and how to find it. And one of the great benefits of eBooks Minnesota, again, and I think Lisa stated this, so I won't go on too much about it, is really ensuring that multi-user access. And that has been key. I think uh, if you're a school librarian, you know what it's like to scour your acquisition service for all of the multi-user titles you can find. Um, and this really alleviates some of that pressure for us, and which has really led to it being integrated well within our curriculum review process. Anytime, anywhere access, again, making sure that our students have access outside of school, that they're a few clicks away from entry into these materials has really been key. Um, sort of the, no, the no brainer here is that we want our students to read for learning and enjoy enjoyment. I'm um, just making sure that they know about it uh, summer, uh, as we do for summer, making sure that our students are aware of this collection um, and know how quick and easy it is to really get to it. I did talk a bit already um, how we're, we are trying to link within as we create our digital resources within our curriculum and units of study, uh, having that access and knowing that that access is owned uh, through Minitex MDE and this partnership really does give us some confidence when we select those resources. Um, we're also enjoying integration through uh, MARC records within our existing ebook platform. So in my district, uh, we're using Mac and Via but it's really just an email away from picking which collections you'd like. They have those records on file and they integrate them with pretty short notice. And it also leads to further exploration of the Electronic Library from Minnesota, um, a Minitex resource uh, that is used by many types of libraries throughout the state, but also provides database access for uh, K-12 grades. And so having that integration uh, also within either our existing platform or just through knowing uh, where to locate the resource has been a huge benefit as we focus on digital content. So that's really just a, a look from my perspective and I'm going to pass this on to Jessica Dugan. Hey everybody, um, so I'm Jessica. I'm the CEO at BiblioLabs. Our software, BiblioBoard, is what you've been hearing about. That's, how, that's the technology behind the eBooks Minnesota project. Um, so a big part of our technology and services that we offer is uh, we track usage data, um, and we track a lot of it. Um, we use a number of methods to gather this data. We use a combination of Google Analytics, which gives us a lot of insight into the location of where the usage is happening. Um, that's very important in a statewide program like eBooks Minnesota that covers a lot of areas. We also use counter data, which is a more traditional method of tracking simple data points like book opens. 
Uh, Tableau is also a piece of software that we use that allows us to uh, manipulate data in such a way that makes it easier for us to analyze trends. And we also use our own in-house tracking systems that we've developed, um, and those cover a wide range of metrics like reading sessions, the platform that books are opened on, um, whether it be your phone or other native apps, um, the days and the times where certain activities occurred, and, and much, much more. And with all this information, we try to accomplish two main goals. One is we want to gather as much information as possible without compromising the privacy of our users, which is especially important um, in a project like eBooks Minnesota that's focused on schools and students. And two, we want to be able to deliver data that allows both the folks at eBooks Minnesota and us at Bibliolabs internally uh, to be able to uncover trends and stories that give us a better understanding of what's really going on with the users of this project. It's pretty easy to provide information about you know, how many books were opened, um, but we really feel that's an incomplete story. Um, and with community platforms and projects like eBooks Minnesota, it's really important to dig in and see what sort of impact you're really having on the community. Um, the eBooks Minnesota project's been live uh, for over a year now, and we've gathered a lot of this data and have uncovered some, some interesting stories and trends that kind of give us a better idea of how this has really impacted the Minnesota community. And I just wanted to share some of those stories with you today. Um, the first trend that I want to talk about involves a feature on our platform that has been mentioned um, in this webinar before. We call it desk curation. It basically allows librarians to search through all of the content that's available to them on BiblioBoard and curate collections based on a particular topic or theme and feature that subset of books um, either on the home page or in very various places on the platform or even to promote that curated collection uh, to any particular audience you know, outside of the library that has access to BiblioBoard. In this case, with geolocation, that's the entire state of Minnesota. So the librarians at uh, Minitex created a, a gardening curation around springtime last year with a few books all about gardening. Um, and as you can imagine, those books were being highlighted in this way, and those had a spike in usage during the months when the gardening curation was active or prominent on the platform. Um, and if you were just looking at this information from a perspective of you know, just numbers, you may say, well, that's pretty obvious. We featured these books, and the usage went up doesn't really affect the overall usage numbers too drastically, you know, maybe it's not that important. But thinking about community impact and looking at the usage sort of in that lens, this trend tells us a lot about how users interact with the platform and with the project. You know, if you're putting books on gardening in front of them, the likelihood that they'll explore them a little closer goes up. And when I look at this, I think, you know, wow, the library has the power using this tool to affect which, affect which books on which topics get out in front of users. And the data suggests that by simply highlighting particular books, you're able to get more people to read them. And maybe people who have never even thought to have opened books on that particular topic or thing before to have read them. So you end up really impacting reading trends in that way. Another trend we've seen suggests that users um, are reading books in series um, on the platform and in the project. Um, on its face, it doesn't sound like much. You know, people read books in series all the time. Um, if you're just looking at the raw numbers, you know, maybe you draw a conclusion that this particular series or that particular series is, you know, somewhat popular, but what does that actually mean in terms of uh, the success of this project and how it's impacting the community? Um, when I looked closely at the data, uh, there's an interesting trend happening. It suggests that if a user reads, you know, book number one in a series, she's much more likely to read book number two in that series. So in this particular example um, of the chart that I have here, we uh, looked at a graphic novel series, and I think Valerie uh, mentioned those have been popular on the platform a little earlier. Um, so over the course of the entire eBooks Minnesota project, book number one in this particular series, you know, had a little over a thousand reads, and book number two just had a little over 500 reads. That's about 50 percent. So interestingly, when you look at books number three, four, and five, and so on in this series, 
they all have about 400 or 500 reads. That's about the same as book number two. So what this tells me is if a reader has read book number one, you know, she's more likely to read book number two. But once she's read book number two, she's almost certainly going to read books three, four, and five and beyond. And this is particularly great, I think, because of the nature of this project being in schools. Um, you know, series and trilogies tend to be aimed at young adults, middle school, high school audiences. And this is a demographic that we're, you know, always focused on getting to read more. And I think this shows that it's working and it can work. You know, even more compelling, some of those reads um, in this particular series happen over the summer when school's out. And there's some reads, you know, not a whole lot, but some that happen on the weekends. Um, it's just another great story that's not readily obvious from just looking at, you know, a stack rank list of, you know, the most read books in the platform. Um, and another story that I wanted to tell you showcases the importance of having uh, all of the methods of tracking that I sort of mentioned at the start. Because eBooks Minnesota is a statewide project, it's important to look at which cities are using the platform the most. You know, that can give you a lot of great information about how maybe we need to educate the libraries or schools in cities where usage is lower, um, or maybe understand more about those uh, libraries' needs to see if we need to, you know, purchase different content or give them uh, different features on the platform that kind of meet those needs. Um, but again, looking at just those usage numbers is only part of that story. Uh, when I was looking at the eBooks Minnesota data, I was looking at a list of the most popular books on the platform. And this was based on, you know, a number, the number of opens that each book had. It's a pretty standard list, um, you know, regardless of what city or county or school or particular library this usage usage happened in. Um, and I was, as I was looking through this data, I was manipulating it on some different factors. And I noticed that that most popular book list changed drastically uh, when I narrowed down the data just to look at usage in a particular city, in this case, Bloomington. And when I compared these two lists, I found that Bloomington's you know, top 20 list had three or four books about koalas, of all things, on it. And when I looked up the top 20 list, you know, for the entire state, there's zero books on koalas. Books on koalas didn't even crack, you know, the top 100, 150 most popular books in the state. In fact, 90% of the reads on books on koalas came from Bloomington. So I took to Google, as um, some are wont to do, uh, and I found this. So a school in Minnesota had their second graders do a koala research project using various resources they could find in their own school library, which of course includes ebooks on koalas provided by ebooks Minnesota. And the reason I love this story is because just looking at usage numbers would have told you that, you know, these koala books maybe weren't as important as the other books on that statewide list because, you know, they didn't have the same high number of reads. And sometimes, you know, that statewide list that overarching list for a particular project in a particular library is something that, you know, libraries go to when they're thinking about, you know, acquisitions budgets or content money. And maybe in certain situations in other projects, you know, books that didn't have as much usage overall maybe it would have gotten cut from whatever project we're talking about. The truth is that these books, you know, while they didn't put up the large numbers that some of the other books in the project did, they had a high impact factor, you know, um, they, were, they were a huge part of a school's entire second grade research project, which I'm sure also tied in, you know, concepts about media literacy and geography and so much more into the curriculum. And that's impact, you know, that's, that's what we really want to measure when we're looking at all of this data, those stories and those trends that we can, that we can get at and tell. And, and I think that's what these community platforms are really all about. So in the future, um, you know, we want to continue to make it easier for libraries to uncover stories like these. You know, there's a lot of data out there. Um, it's tough to kind of sift through all of it and, and really figure out where impact is happening. And everyone involved in the eBooks Minnesota has been amazing to really seeing this succeed through those stories, you know, about how it's impacted the schools and communities in their state. You know, they've done that through promotions and organized marketing and integrating it into classrooms, kind of what you've heard about. 
um, they've been being committed to geolocation, which is key, and you know, being committed to unlimited multi-user access content. You know, many of these stories that I just mentioned couldn't really have happened if those students had to put holds on these books. Um, and so to that end, you know, publishers like Joe at North Star Editions have really stepped up um, and outside of the box of those traditional licensing models that we usually see in libraries to make that possible. Uh, so our hope at Biblio Labs is to continue to see usage uh, being evaluated, you know, in terms of impact um, and to really see more of these trends and stories like I've shared with you. And I hope we can continue to see great impact from eBooks Minnesota Project and hopefully in community library projects like it. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you to all of our panelists today. Uh, your Jessica's comments about the power of data and the stories that data can tell uh, reminds me of I, when I was in practice in a school library, we had a te an English teacher who did a senior English project on the Neil Diamond song, Gun Too Soon. So you had a, you, we had so many students not only having to look up you know look up the song itself, but then looking up the the figures and um, to write their persuasive paper on if the people included in the song were actually done too soon. So that the stats that that story told, like in our public library and things, they were like, "What are you guys researching over there?" So um, data can really tell a rich story. That um, and so that was that was neat to in dig in and see a little bit more about the usage of the koala books. Um, we've heard from all of these great panelists today and some great stories about eBooks Minnesota. It's certainly a case study in collaboration between state organizations and school libraries and adheres to that library transform mission of leveraging and embracing technology to deliver an experience that can really engage a large community of readers through the library. Uh, Obviously, this project took a lot of time and hard work to put together that was so beautifully described earlier in the webinar. Uh, and really, it's the great thing about technology and the model is that it can be replicated in other states and other communities. And we would love to hear from, uh, from you if you have questions about that. So we have some time for questions now. And I think there was a question earlier in the chat that I also wanted to ask too. So while this is wonderful on a statewide level, can someone speak to how, if there's a certain school district or just a city that could support this, it, can geolocation be limited to just that area or does it have to, it's statewide the only way that um, this model has worked? So this is Jessica, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, our technology allows for geolocation on a number of different levels, um, obviously the eBooks Minnesota um, project is for the geolocated for the whole state, but we also offer a geolocation authentication down to a county level. So if your library services an entire county um, covering multiple cities or towns, uh, we can uh, light that up as geolocation for the entire county or down to the particular city. Um, we're also working on uh, some interesting technology advancements where, you know, maybe something geolocated just sort of in the vicinity or small town um, that your library is located in. But right now we do uh, support geolocation authentication down to the city level, which could be really exciting um, and really give uh, even some smaller libraries some, uh, some opportunities to, to have some really interesting projects. Thank you, Jessica. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, I do. There will be a, um, an archive of today's webinar, so keep a lookout for that. And maybe someone can include in the chat on where that would be available. Uh, I'm not finding that information right in front of me. Um, but if, 
I hope you have enjoyed digging into uh, the, enjoying the first of the Library Transform webinars presented by ALA. And thanks again to BiblioBoard for their support of uh, today's webinar, uh, uh, it, helping us all learn more about eBooks Minnesota and how to replicate that. We hope you've learned a lot and are inspired to embrace these ideas or technology in your projects or figure out ways to uh, partner with um, other uh, agencies in your area to, to make this happen. So, thank you all very much.